Okay, well, thank you for joining us tonight for this presentation, which is on the science of cannabinoids. Uh, my name is Monica Anzalone, and I am from the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut. I'm going to be hosting and moderating the presentation for tonight. Um, so the interest in medical cannabis, we know, has widely increased over the years, and specifically in the epilepsy community, there's been recent innovations created to treat seizures. Our speaker tonight is a medical science liaison with Greenwich Biosciences, who is the manufacturer of Epidiolex, which is a prescription medicine that's used to treat seizures, specifically associated with lennox gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, or tuberous sclerosis complex, which are epilepsy syndromes. And while she may not be discussing specifically um, on the topic of Epidiolex tonight, she will be talking about um, cannabis, um, which is what the drug is derived from, and she'll be discussing this, the science behind that drug. So our webinar tonight um, will attempt to answer that question of what is cannabis, and we're going to be touching on the topics that include the history of regulations and terminology, as well as the biology of the cannabis plant. We'll also learn the differences in cannabis-based products and a sampling of consumer protection concerns. The presentation is being recorded. So for sound quality purposes, we're just gonna ask everyone to just remain muted throughout the presentation, even though I know it's a smaller group tonight, just to help us with sound quality. If you have any questions, go ahead and just type those in the chat box and we're gonna answer them as they come up. So I'll be checking that, that box frequently throughout the presentation. So I'm gonna introduce our presenter tonight, um, Jessica. Duhame is a doctor of pharmacy, and she is also a board-certified pediatric pharmacy specialist. Uh, she was previously a clinical pharmacist at Boston Children's Hospital, where she was part of the inpatient neurology and epilepsy teams. In Jessica's current role as a medical science liaison at Greenwich Biosciences, she is a cannabinoid science expert and she's very excited to be here tonight and for the opportunity to talk to you all about this topic. So I'm going to go ahead and let Jessica get started. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Monica. You can still hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining the webinar. I'm really, like Monica said, excited for the opportunity and hopefully we can have a nice discussion about epidial, or sorry, not about epidiolex, about cannabis and the science uh, and societal concerns around some of the unregulated products that are not epidiolex. And so I just want to start with a quick disclaimer that the information in this presentation is just for your informational purposes only, and it's not intended to substitute any medical advice. And so if you have any questions about your treatment or a medical condition and the treatment for that medical condition, please consult your physician or a qualified healthcare provider um, for more information. And as Monica said, we're gonna have a question and answer session at the conclusion of the presentation, but feel free to drop any questions that you have along the way in the chat. I know it's a smaller group, so I'm okay with you, you know, coming off, off mute if you'd like and just uh, asking your question as well. And so just a quick overview of what I'm going to be discussing, we're going to start by talking about uh, the history and regulations around cannabis and, and clearing up a few misconceptions or preconceptions that are really widespread in our society at this time. Then we'll go into a little bit more about the cannabis plant, uh, talk about some definitions, and then just some basic scientific information. We'll conclude with some practical considerations and public health concerns. And my overall goal is to provide you with general scientific information and evidence-based information that will help inform you and keep you aware of what is known as well as what is unknown in this space in order for you to be a well-informed consumer or advocate. So let's start by thinking about what is cannabis and is cannabis a medicine? So when we think about medicine, medicines are defined as chemicals or compounds that are used to cure, halt, or prevent diseases. They can also ease symptoms or diseases or even help with the diagnosis of an illness. 
And we are probably aware that the Food and Drug Administration is our overarching um, protector of our medicines in our country. And so the FDA was established in order to protect consumers. And they really are the regulating body that's responsible, responsible for protecting you. And they stand between what's on the shelf and what you consume. And so any product that claims that it is used for the diagno diagnosis, cure, treatment or prevention of disease is considered a medicine by the FDA. And as such, it must undergo the FDA approval process. And so this FDA approval process, if you're not aware, it includes rigorous clinical controlled trials, usually starting with small studies in animals just to test for safety. And then we make our way all the way up to studies in large numbers of human patients to not only test the safety of a product, but also to test the efficacy of a product. And then all of this information is combined and submitted to the FDA for their approval before it is able to be marketed as a medicine or claim that it has any therapeutic benefit um, or any disease claims. And so keeping that in mind, think about what you know about cannabis. Cannabis, it contains, it's a plant, it contains many different molecules, just like a medicine, but it, um, the, the potential is still largely unknown. We do, as Monica mentioned, have one FDA approved product that is cannabis derived, um, and that is avail available by prescription. But think about all of the other products that are available on the market that aren't necessarily that haven't necessarily been approved by the FDA. And so it's important as consumers um, or potential in consumers to be aware of the, these facts in order to make educated decisions about what you're taking. And so as we go through the webinar tonight, I hope to try to attempt to answer these qu questions by presenting scientific information and help you better understand what is known and unknown. So the other idea that a plant um, contains medicine is really not a new idea. However, just because there's medicine from the plant doesn't make the plant medicinal. And so as I mentioned, cannabis contains molecules that can potentially improve the symptoms of a disease, but that doesn't necessarily mean the entire plant can. And so while we're here today to talk about cannabis, let's think of some other plants that have medicine in them. So you may have heard of uh, belladonna or nightly dead shade. And so nightly dead shade is a highly toxic plant that's typically used as a poison, but it does also contain medicine. So it contains both scopolamine and atropine, which are drugs that have FDA approved uses in treating motion sick sickness, Parkinson-like muscle problems, as well as IBS. And deadly nightshade, um, the atropine component is used as an emergency treatment for pesticide poisoning. Another member of the nightshade family that you may have heard of before is tobacco, and it's well known and marketed for recreational purposes. And tobacco contains nicotine, which aside from being highly addictive, has also demonstrated some effects in studies for improving memory as well as concentration. And you don't typically associate tobacco with memory and concentration, right? But at tightly controlled um, doses, nicotine is also used over the counter in patches and lozenge form to help curb addiction and help with smoking cessation. And now we know that uh, nightshade as well as tobacco are plants. And there's a, also this misconception that because cannabis is a plant and it's grown in the ground, therefore it's natural and it's harmless. And that's not always the case. So I want you to picture you're hiking in the woods and you're hungry or your loved one is hungry. Would you tell them just to pick the berries that you come across, even if you didn't know what they were? Probably not, right? I'm not a botanist, but I personally would avoid consuming or even touching things that were unknown to me because you never know what's going to be poison ivy, right? So on this slide are some examples of plants that contain molecules that can be harmful and toxic. And there is evidence that there's potential for therapeutic, with, uh, for therapeutic uses with plants. However, there's also potential harm that's associated with plants. And so listed here, water hemlock and white 
snake root. They're found in nature in North America, but both can cause toxic effects and lead to severe poisoning if they're consumed. And so something we don't often consider is that whatever is found in the soil can also be absorbed by these plants. So botanical products can commonly be contaminated with not only microbes and pesticides, but industrial compounds and solvents that are used for harvesting and processing. And so when we go to the grocery store, think about when you buy your tomatoes. You usually trust that tomatoes have been grown in good conditions without harmful, pe harmful pesticides. And that's due to our agricultural oversight from the government. And so remembering that cannabis is also a plant and can contain potentially harmful contents from the so soil and absorb those, it's important to think about that and what potential hazards that could cause and could be associated when consumed by humans. And so now let's look into the history and regulations and kind of better understand how we got to where we are today. And so if we go back in time a little bit, we can get a better understanding of where we are now. So cannabis use and the medicinal properties of the plant have been documented as far back as, as the 27th century BC. And its first recorded use to treat seizures was actually way back in 1839. After that, at one point, cannabis was even sold over the counter at pharmacies. Imagine just going into your CVS these days and asking for some cannabis over the counter. That's what it used to be like. And so with this long history of medicinal cannabis use, even in the United States, why is it only now that we're seeing cannabis-based medicine available? Well, in the 20th century, at the end of the prohibition era in the United States, cannabis was being sold at the pharmacies. And we all know, we all knew, and even back then uh, knew that cannabis consumption were ha was having that psychoactive effect when it was used. And at that time, no one really understood what in the plant was actually causing that therapeutic or euphoric effect. And so when we think about cannabis, it contains these small molecules called cannabinoids. And these cannabinoids are very difficult to isolate from not only the plant, but from each other. And so unfortunately, back then, we didn't have the technology that we have now to isolate these small molecules. So cannabis was not recognized or accepted as having any medical use or therapeutic benefit. And ultimately, it was caught in the middle of this regula regulatory uh, landscape. And so by the time science finally started catching up, the molecules from the plant were being isolated and synthesized, but there was already legislation that was being put in place or already established that were prohibiting its use. And you can see here on the slide that the Controlled Substance Act or the CSA was put into place in the 1970s. And so the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, administration or the DEA is the lead federal law enforcement agency that's responsible for enforcing the Controlled Substance Act. And it was put in place to improve control over the manufacture, distribution, and dispensing of controlled substances. And according to this act, drugs are categorized into five schedules based on their therapeutic use and abuse potential. Schedule one drugs in the CSA are subjected to the most strict regulations in the realm of research, supply, and transport. And so without any knowledge at the time of how the cannabis plant was having its effect, but, um, when this act was put into place, cannabis was placed into a Schedule I designation. And so much of the research that has been done before recent years was based on the abuse potential of cannabis as opposed to the potential medicinal uses. Another significant piece of cannabis uh, regulation that I wanna mention is called the Agriculture Improve Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, which is also known as the Farm Bill. And prior to 2018, the Controlled Substance Act did not define hemp separate from cannabis. However, cannabis and hemp are the same plant. Only in 2018 with this bill did they legally define cannabis as two separate types of plants. So they legally defined hemp under this bill as a cannabis plant containing less than 0.3% of THC 
on a dry weight basis. And this bill also descheduled all hemp derived cannabinoids from the Controlled Substance Act, including CBD or cannabidiol, as long as it came from a plant containing less than 0.3% THC. On the other hand, it, the uh, Farm Bill legally defined marijuana as any cannabis plant containing greater than 0.3% THC. And so any of the constituents, including cannabinoid derivatives like CBD that come from a plant containing greater than 0.3% THC is still defined as coming from marijuana and still considered to be a Schedule I substance and federally illegal. So there's a lot of confusion around this and I'll go into it a little bit more in depth as we go into the presentation. But if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And something that when I learned about this farm bill, I was wondering was why did they come to this definition? How did they get this number? Why did they even define these differently? Well, the federal government created a legal distinction between hemp and marijuana because cannabis has a wide variety of uses outside of therapeutics. And that is where these legal distinctions first emerge. So hemp is actually a source of, um, of a variety of products and they're demonstrated on the slide here. So traditionally hemp plants have long bark-like fibers that are used in plastics, they're used in construction materials, as well as in paper and textiles. And fun fact, the term cannabis, uh, or the word can, sorry, the, term, the word canvas is actually derived from cannabis because the original canvases were made from hemp products, uh, which is a type of cannabis plant. And so hemp has been used for therapeutic and, um, and other uses for thousands of years. And it wasn't until this recent le legislation that we started to see these cannabis plants, they were starting to be bred for different purposes. So instead of just use in um, you know, livestock feed and construction materials, they were starting to be bred for high CBD content and low THC content and still considered hemp. And so you're probably wondering, why are there CBD products everywhere if marijuana is still a Schedule I controlled substance? Well, this is where they're coming from. So while the farm bill said that hemp was legal, it inadvertently created this avenue for cannabis plants to be grown with small amounts of THC, but other cannabinoids in them that can be extracted. And this created the CBD boom everywhere. And so, even though the farm bill descheduled hemp and it's no longer considered federally illegal and it's legal to grow this plant, it is still illegal to introduce any products that aren't approved by the FDA as food, dietary supplements, or medicine um, that claim they have use in diagnosing, curing, treating, or preventing any diseases unless they're approved by the FDA. So remember the medicines are what's been approved by the FDA for the use of treatment and diseases. And if it's not approved, then it can't claim that it's a medicine. And so even though we have all these products that are technically being grown and um, created legally under this farm bill, it's still not legal to claim that they have any therapeutic benefit. And so if you see here, we've come a really long way over the last 21 years um, in terms of the legalization of cannabis and marijuana in our country. And so as of March of this year, 19 states have fully legalized the use of recreational and medical marijuana. 18 have legalized the use of medical marijuana, including Connecticut, and only two states, Idaho and Nebraska, have no cannabis legislation at this time. And so remember, federally, cannabis is still schedule, technically a Schedule I controlled substance under the Controlled Substance Act. And because federal law trumps state law, if the DEA wanted to, it could have the authority to come into a state and, and enforce federal law. And so while there's this increase in access to cannabis throughout the country, there's this clear discrepancy 
between the federal and state laws. And really, this is the first time that this is happening. And the first time that states have gone outside of the FDA, even by using the term medicinal marijuana, implying that it's a medicine and in the same category as other medicines. And so this leaves consumers faced with something that's claiming to have medicinal use outside of FDA regulation. And so this lack of federal guidance and unfortunately recent changes to hemp laws have resulted in a really confusing space for the public and for the consumers of any cannabis products. And not only that, but it's led to a patchwork of regulation with different states having different laws around testing, around labeling, around all different aspects of, of control of cannabis. And so I want you to start thinking about how discrepancies between these regulations can cause issues and safety concerns for consumers of these products. And so just to clarify some more terminology, when we talk about cannabis, we have these legal terms that I've mentioned, we have scientific terms, we have marketing terms, and it can all be very confusing. But use of cannabis in the United States is generally described within four primary product categories. And so I wouldn't mind a little bit of audience participation here. I want to know if anyone can tell me what is the difference between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana? And there are only a few of us, so free, feel free to come off mute, talk to me, tell me you're here. I can't see anyone, I'm just looking at my slides. Uh, this is Liz. Uh, Hi, Liz. Yeah, sorry, I go off camera sometimes, but I have to. Um, I think medical marijuana can be, um, I guess, more customized so that maybe like there's less THC, it's almost like going to the marrow, you know, it's like if you have certain things that you're allergic to, or it can be, I guess, custom designed for certain illnesses is what I believe. I think recreational can be as well. Um, I don't smoke it, but I, I know a lot of people that do and go to the stores and it's, you know, if you don't want, if you want to high in a certain way, or you don't want the THC because you have allergies or whatever your conditions are, that's what is my understanding. Don't know. Okay. Anyone else want to contribute? Okay, no pressure. Oh, Joanne, do you want to say something? I would think that if it's medical, there might be a little um, more control of it. Not like something you can get on the street that's laced with all kinds of different things. I would hope if it says medical that there's some kind of control over what's going on. Yeah, I think those are both very, very good answers. And I think that there are so many different th thoughts and beliefs behind differences between medical and recreational marijuana. So interestingly, there is actually no difference between recreational and medical marijuana. The only difference is the intent of use. And so you can sell the same exact product from a plant as medical marijuana or as recreational marijuana. And Liz and Joanne, you both made great points. So you hope that it's not laced with anything harmful. You hope that it's, you know, that the recommendations that you're getting where you're purchasing it, you're probably purchasing, purchasing it different places if it's recreational versus medical, depending on your state laws. But you hope that they're giving you recommendations based on whatever ailment you're trying to treat. But really the only difference is the intent to use. And that's actually how cannabis products are defined in the United States. So you could have the same product. It can be defined as medical marijuana if it's intent to use um, it with, if it's intent of use is an attempt to treat disease or alleviate symptoms by patient choice. And so it's important to understand that there's really a lack of placebo controlled trials to support any efficacy and safety of these products. And they can contain various amounts of THC and CBD as well as other cannabinoids that we'll talk about in a little bit. Compare that, oopsies, I went forward too many times. There we go. Compare that to recreational marijuana products 
which are intended to be used recreationally, you know, to get high or to induce pleasure, euphoria, relaxation, things like that. And so can a doctor prescribe medical marijuana? Well, no, because doctors by law can only prescribe products that have been FDA approved. And so FDA approved products, you would write a prescription, or the doctor would write a prescription, right? And they'd give it to a patient. And their expectation is that that patient is going to bring the prescription to the pharmacy and the pharmacy will fill exactly what is written on their prescription, right? So that's the prescription. Now, medical providers can certify a patient um, or an offer recommendations for medical marijuana use. Now, the difference between a recommendation and a prescription is that when a, a provider recommends a, pro, a medical marijuana, that patient can go with their certification card based on their qualifying condition to the dispensary, and they can say, my doctor authorized me to use this, and they can actually get whatever product that they like you know, depending on their personal preference, they don't have to get exactly what was recommended. And so that's the big difference between these unregulated and regulated products is that there's no requirement for the patient to use exactly what the provider recommends. And there's really that lack of oversight in that whole area, you know, between the certifying provider and the person that's consuming. Whereas with a prescription, you would expect that what was written on the prescription is exactly what the patient's going to be taking. And so this leaves that, you know, huge contrast where pharmaceutical formulations that we write on prescriptions are regulated by the FDA and they can be plant derived or they can be synthetically made in a lab, but they all must conform to good manufacturing standards um, that meet you know, standards for purity, standards for consistency, standards for stability, safety, efficacy in that whole FDA um, approval rigorous process. And so just reiterating the difference between medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, and then the pharmaceutical formulations, there's also that hemp space that we just talked about, right? So we have hemp that has uh, low cannabinoid content typically in these plants. And after the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, it was legally defined as a cannabis plant containing no more than 0.3% of THC on a dry weight basis. And that includes any extracts, derivatives, and cannabinoids that are derived from the plant. Look, taking a little bit of a closer look at hemp and adding to the confusion, Remember how I mentioned that there are legal terms, there are marketing terms and scientific terms. So here is some of the marketing terminology that you might see when you are looking at these products and you're um, you know, trying to make decisions of, and, and decipher what it really means. And so we know what hemp is now and hemp, um, these products are descheduled and so the materials that are found in hemp, in the stalks and the oils and the seeds, they, the FDA does not analyze any of these products to make sure that they're meeting any of those safety criteria that the pharmaceutical formulations of products would. And so recognizing the difference between these legal definitions and marketing terms, even without any FDA oversight, there's still products that are being marketed to people and sold in the United States. And so they're listed here. I'm not gonna read everything out to you because they're probably familiar terms that you've seen before. And so a full spectrum extract is a marketing term. A broad spectrum extract is a marketing term and a CBD isolate is a marketing term. And the important thing to remember is that none of these have been analyzed by the FDA and none of these are considered scientific terms. They just are marketing way, uh, a marketing term to describe different um, extracts from the hemp plant. And now with all of that information in mind, where are we now with cannabis? It's come a long way over the last 5,000 years. And so some states are trying to regulate it, but there's still no federal oversight. 
And this lack of guidance um, in the recent changes in laws has not only con contributed to the a very confu confusing space to the public, but it also means that these products, as I mentioned, aren't subjected to any safety standards like pharmaceuticals. They're not subjected to agricultural safety and pesticide standards like crops, and they're um, not subjected to the safety standards that are in that are measured in prepared foods, and they're also not subjected to the labeling standards like alcohol. So it's really just a whole different uh, space, and it's very confusing and can be compounded in addition to the aggressive commercialization that I'm sure you've seen to create some somewhat of a public health risk because these products are not necessarily benign. And so let's talk a little bit about cannabis and then you'll hopefully understand why. So I'm sure you've heard the term cannabinoid before. <laughs> So they fall into three primary classes. Cannabinoids are just small molecules, and they were originally isolated from the cannabis sativa plant. But over time, this definition has expanded and into these three different categories. And so phytocannabinoids are the plant-based compounds that are found in the cannabis sativa plant, and they may function through our cannabinoid receptors in our body. And then endocannabinoids are our endogenous ligands or the molecules that our bodies make. And they interact with these same cannabinoid receptors. And the last class of molecules are synthetic cannabinoids. And those are artificially synthesized in a lab to mimic the structure and or function of endocannabinoids or phytocannabinoids. And these products are used clinically for research purposes or for illicit use. And so when you think of phytocannabinoids, think from the plant, endocannabinoids are from the body, and then synthetic are from the lab. And it's important to note that this classification is independent of legality. And so as the science in this field of research is continuing to develop, these definitions are also evolving. And our primary source of phytocannabinoids or the ones that come from the plant are from the cannabis sativa L plant. So there are three things that I want you to remember about the cannabis plant. So the cannabis sativa species is one species, but it has many varieties. So this is the first thing. Historically, the species varieties used to be categorized into two, um, two different subspecies, indica and sativa. However, based on the interbreeding that's happened over time, the current botanical thinking is that now there's just one single genus, cannabis sativa L genus. And so these plants are your primary source of phytocannabinoids. And even though there is one species, there are many varieties. And the three main ones are shown here, similar to tomatoes again. So when you think of, diff of tomatoes, they're one type of I guess it's a fruit, one type of fruit, but there are many different varieties. You've got the heirloom tomatoes, the cherry tomatoes, the plum tomatoes, and they're used for different purposes. So similar to cannabis, you have your cannabis sativa is your big category with your different varieties. You have the tall ones, the hemp plant that are the, this other variety that's noted at the top here. Then you have um, short broadleaf ones that are considered indica. And then you have the ruderalis, which are generally low in cannabinoid content. And so this plant shape size aren't indicative of any of the cannabinoid content or chemical composition. So fact one is cannabis is one species with many varieties. Fact two is that all of these cannabis varieties produce cannabinoids, but the ratios of cannabinoid content in the plants varies. And so there are over 100 identified cannabinoids, but with all the interbreeding that has happened, all the content in it can really vary widely, not only between plant to plant, but um, between the other subspecies that exist. So fact one, cannabis has um, different varieties. The varieties contain different amounts of cannabinoids. And then the third fact is that cannabis plants are potent phytoremediators. 
And so phytoremediation is the direct use of living green plants for the removal, degradation, or containment of contaminants in soils, sludges, surface water, or groundwater. And so I like to think of them as sponges because they really absorb everything in the soil around them. And historically, cannabis was used to be planted by farmers to clean the soil before crops were planted. And so that means with plants that are sponges, anything that can be found in the soil can be found inside of these plants. And in a study that was actually looking at phytoremediation, the phytoremediation potential of hemp, it found that heavy metals, including nickel, lead, and cadmium, could be detected in all parts of the plant, which are of commercial interest, with the highest concentration found in the plant leaves. And so here's just a quick look at some of the cannabis constituents. So we mentioned cannabinoids before, and on this slide, we're referring to phytocannabinoids, or the ones that are found in the cannabis plant. And two of the most well-known are THC or Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol and CBD or cannabidiol. But there are hundreds of compounds that can be divided into several groups. The three main groups here, cannabinoids, terpenes, and other compounds. And so cannabinoids, just a few of the hundred listed here, um, what, based on what we know about the cannabis plant, they can really vary not only from plant to plant, but depending on growth conditions, location, plant processing methods, et cetera. And so consequently, the pharmacological or potential therapeutic effects of whole cannabis extracts can vary widely. Terpenes are widespread throughout the plant kingdom. They're not exclusive to cannabis but they are responsible for contributing to um, an entourage effect, and they are what give cannabis its distinct smell. And so entourage effect is what's described as a pharmacological synergy that occurs between cannabinoids and the other compounds in the cannabis plant, particularly the terpenes. And so this potential interaction is still not well understood. And so just think about with all these different things that are in this cannabis plant, how many possible outcomes you could have and how many possible um, combinations of different constituents could be found in these varieties. And then the last section are other <laughs> compounds. And these are also thought to play a synergistic role and may mitigate some of the side effects of the primary constituents, but more research is needed to really understand the pharmacological role of these um, compounds. And then I'm gonna just skip over this slide for time purposes, but thinking about all of the compounds that are in the product, um, it, this slide looks really scientifically advanced, but even without understanding any organic chemistry, you can probably glance at it and see that these structures are pretty similar, right? So these are just the chemical structures of some of the most well-researched cannabinoids. And the small changes in these structures cause a big change in function. So if you can see just here with THC and CBD, the only difference is this tiny bond. It's very, very small. However, THC binds to our CB1 receptor, and that is what's responsible for causing the euphoric or psychoactive effects. And just that small change in structure from THC to CBD um, makes CBD have no affinity for that same receptor, which is why CBD has no euphoric effects that is associated with it. And so just think when you have all of these different compounds in a plant that are being consumed in all different structures, they have to be considered each as their own pharmacological identity and tested individually to determine their profile and their possible therapeutic effects. So it's a lot more complicated than just, you know, trying different plants on uh, different, you know, diseases. And so now let's get into some of the consumer protection concerns. So the, we've already discussed how the FDA inspects medicines and manufacturing practices um, in order to protect patients from harm. Um, and so some things that ha have come to light with the lack of oversight and regulation is that there has been mislabeling of content, contamination of products, 
um, inaccurate product expiration dates, inappropriate doses, um, product inconsistency, whether it's batch to batch or even bottle to bottle. And add on to that the fact that cannabinoid education is not typically taught in most medical or pharmacy schools, and it can be potentially dangerous. And so outside of these clinical trials, much of the data that people have relied on is from preclinical evidence or animal studies and or anecdotal information and, you know, word of mouth. And with the state to state variation in the medicinal and recreational cannabis law, this has led to a number of um, false uh, recommendations based on little, little evidence with little training. And so let's just look at a few of these, um, a few of these concerns. And we'll start with the contamination. So we already talked about the fact that um, commercially available CBD products, there could be a lot of um, confusion about what's actually in the bottle. We know that cannabis is a phytoremediator, right? So it can absorb things. And there's the lack of standardization around testing from state to state. And so you can see here just a few examples from around the country of instances of contaminated CBD products. There have been reports of pesticides, labeled CBD products containing THC, as well as mold and bacteria. And this can all be very harmful when consumed. And so while many believe that these products are benign and harmless, without this rigorous testing requirements and standard, standardized regulation, there's really no way to ensure that what is in the bottle is safe. So as we mentioned, cannabis is a phytoremediator and it can absorb anything in the soil. So that's why these things are happening. It's not that people are intentionally, you know, adulterating these products. It's that this plant is naturally absorbing what's in the soil and without any testing standards, there's no way to ensure that any product that is um, unregulated on the, and available on the market doesn't contain any of these. And so that's why these meticulous growing, harvesting, extraction, manufacturing um, must be in place to really ensure product safety. Additionally, even though we don't know what's in the bottle, you hope to trust the label that's on the bottle, right? Well, again, due to lack of regulation, the research has shown that labeling of product content can also unfortunately be inaccurate. So some CBD oil products may contain THC or they may contain less levels of CBD than actually reported on the label. And one study published in the, American, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association in 2017 said that nearly 70% of the tested products were mislabeled in respect to cannabinoid content. And these products were all currently um, available online. And because of this, the authors, which were all, who were all academic researchers at Johns Hopkins, concluded that the unregulated products should be avoided in pediatric patients. And so that's just one study, but it's kind of a good, I like this, the, the circles to the charts to visualize the inaccuracy that could be surrounding these products that are available to us. And then more recently, in March of this year, uh, there was a report that came out from the FDA that showed the testing results of products, and it was really stunning. So aside from the false medical claims and inaccurate labels, um, the FDA has sent over 100 warning letters to CBD manufacturers due, uh, to help resolve this issue. However, I think you know there's been a pandemic, and this legal, uh, this legal change only happened in 2018. And so once things started to ramp up and COVID happened, the FDA and DEA resources were really diverted elsewhere. And so they've really focused their efforts on sending letters to the companies that are making the most egregious and um, unsubstantiated medical claims associated with their products. But unfortunately, they don't have the resources at the time to regulate this space and control and monitor um, all of the companies that are producing um, unregulated THC and or CBD products. And so this is another key concern. And, and like I mentioned before, the, the Farm Bill kind of inadvertently led 
like created this pathway. And so these products are being sold and consumed and they're stating that even though they're derived from a hemp product that contains less than 0.3% THC, there still might be some in there. And so when you think about 0.3% THC, what does that really mean? And as we wrap up, I, I feel like this is a very impactful way to, to think about things. And so 0.3%, it seems like a small amount, right? But when we think about how much um, THC that you're consuming, let's think about how much it takes to actually feel intoxicated or high. So studies have shown it takes about 10 milligrams of THC for an adult person to feel those intoxicating effects. And um, in a retail setting today, you can purchase a 30 milliliter bottle of CBD oil. And that CBD oil derived from hemp could contain up to 0.3% of THC and still be below that legal threshold. Therefore, if we do the math out, which I won't make you do, <laughs> a single four gram gummy could contain up to 12 milligrams of THC. And putting this in perspective, some state recreational marijuana dispensaries where people are going to remember that intentional purpose of consuming a product for its um, euphoric or intoxicating effects, the maximum legal limit is 50 milligrams per product per person. And if, and then compare that to the starting dose of FDA approved synthetic products um, of pres prescription THC, which is 2.5 milligrams. And so this retail CBD could contain the amount of THC that would be equal to about 32 doses of prescription THC, all without the consumer's knowledge. And so unlike the recreational dispensaries, or the prescription drugs, retail CBD doesn't have that labeling requirement to indicate that there's any THC um, in the product. And so consumers could be unknowingly consuming intoxicating amounts of THC. And based on this, 0.3% doesn't seem as small anymore, right? I'm a pharmacist by training, so I love these math problems. <laughs> so, to conclude, we just established that 0.3% THC is not necessarily a small amount and can theoretically be enough to cause a potential high. Now, another misconception is that CBD has no side effects, but when you search the National Library of Medicine, it really tells a different story. And so whether the information has come from clinical trials or uncontrolled observational studies, it does seem that CBD has an adverse event profile. And you can see some of the most commonly represented, ad, uh, commonly reported adverse effects here. However, without the FDA oversight, there's really no central tracking system for adverse effects. So whether it's from a vaccine or a prescription product, there's a central system where um, pharmacists and providers and patients can report any adverse effects. But with unregulated products like um, that are available over the counter, there's really no way to know not only what the patient um, consumed, but there's no um, standardized tracking. And so this can be harmful. And it's important to keep in mind that these natural products don't always mean safe or that they're benign or that they have no side effects. All right. And so Thank you for your attention. To wrap up today's presentation, even with a rich history of use dating back 5,000 years, we've learned that cannabis is not necessarily benign. We discussed the three different classes of cannabinoids. There's the endocannabinoids, which come from our body, the phytocannabinoids that come from the plant, as well as the synthetic cannabinoids that are coming from the lab. And these cannabis plants not only contain cannabinoids, but other non-cannabinoid components that potentially have their own pharmacological profiles, as well as therapeutic effects. Cannabis has three important properties. There are many varieties. There is the potential for them to be interbred. And they're also sponges and phytoremediators. So they absorb everything in the soil. The existing legal landscape and the conflicts between state and federal regulations have led to a confusing product landscape for consumers. And it's really 
crucial to fully understand the importance of clinical research um, in order to uh, appreciate the therapeutic potential of the cannabis plant and its components. And so I wanna leave you with this because knowledge matters. And so I encourage you to continue learning. We have a trusted website for um, all things cannabis and cannabinoids, and it's called cannabinoidclinical.com. It is not only for healthcare providers, it is for everyone who would like to learn more information about cannabinoids uh, that comes from a trusting source and that um, you know has been backed by as much rigorous science that you can expect. Thank you again for your attention. Are there, if there are any questions, I'm happy to clarify anything or, or go through anything further. No, it was very clear. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Sorry, I wasn't on camera the whole time, but thank Oh, you. don't worry about it. I, I couldn't really see anyone until, until the okay, end. Good. No. <laughs> um, no, I guess in the future, I just want to know how it relates more to epilepsy in the sense of, you know, Sure. My world here with my kid, but it made yeah. a lot of sense. I learned a lot. Thank you. That's great. I mean, I'm happy to, to, to kind of talk to that. What is known right now um, about the way that CBD works in seizures is that it, we know that it doesn't work through the cannabinoid receptors, interestingly. And so that's why with THC, we know it works through those cannabinoid receptors that we have, and that's also what's causing the euphoric effect. However, with CBD, in the studies that have been done, it's been shown that it's not ex exerting its anti-seizure effects through the same mechanism because it's not causing any of that euphoria. So there is data that exists about the fact that it does not work through that cannabinoid receptor, but research is still being done to fully understand how it's exerting its anti-seizure effects. So to clarify that, if you have, cause my son is older, someone who smokes a lot, who says it decreases their anxiety, does it actually help to prevent seizures? And is, it's never been proven um, that it's good or bad for someone who has seizures. He has, he has them rarely, but claims it decreases his anxiety, therefore makes his life more bearable. But I worry about the effects on his brain. Yeah, that's completely understandable. I think there's still so much unknown. There have been a lot of studies that have been done about the different cannabinoids and their effects on cognition and their effects um, on seizures and effects on behavior, um, especially over time. But as you can see with the the regulatory landscape, there are a lot of barriers to actually getting those full clinical studies to understand the long-term effects, um, whether it's in epilepsy or on cognition. And so I know the things that we do know now is that THC does have the potential to be pro-convulsant, um, but it does also have studies in animals, in animals that have shown that it can be anti-convulsant. And so I can't make any recommendations about, you know, one way or the other because it's such an evolving space and there's so much still unknown, but I do know that, you know, there's a lot of information out there. And if you're curious about like any specific products or anything like that, then he can talk to his medical provider. And I always encourage telling your providers that you're using any supplements, including marijuana, so they can take that into account with their treatment. Yeah, no, and he does. He's very honest with his neurologist yeah. and his doctors. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I wish I could give you a more definitive answer based no, on that's okay. available, but I, I think you can understand now why it's such a, it's such right. a confusing and evolving field. Yes, I can. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question, Liz. So I had asked my daughter's neurologist about medical marijuana just because she is on so many medicines for seizures like and I worry about the long term taking three different seizure meds twice a day plus everything else they're throwing at her and I did bring it up with her neurologist and I thought he had said that there was one 
company that insurance companies would work with for medical marijuana. So is that controlled? Is that clean? Does that have anything from, you know, the ground in it that we need to worry about? I mean, I have so many more questions now after watching this and listening than I had before. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't intend to, to do no, that, no, no, but no. I think there's a lot of unknowns that a lot of consumers don't know. And this is kind of highlighting like all the different considerations, but to answer your question, so there is one FDA approved product and it is from Greenwich Biosciences um, and it is a cannabis derived product and the name is Epidiolex. It's a highly purified cannabidiol or CBD oral solution. And it has gone through all of the FDA rigorous requirements and approval process um, in order to receive its indication of use, which is it's currently indicated, as Monica mentioned at the beginning, for seizures associated with lennox gastro syndrome, Gervais syndrome, as well as tuberous sclerosis complex in patients age one and older. And unlike the unregulated products that I was speaking about, Epidiolex, even though it's from cannabis, it, because it's botanically derived, it is not only held to the good manufacturing practices that other pharmaceutical products are held to, but it's also held to the good agricultural practices that anything in our, you know, that we consume food-wise is held to. And so we have very rigorous requirements and standards that we abide by in order to ensure consistency batch to batch and, um, you know, to avoid any variability, as well as, you know, we have proven efficacy and safety in many randomized control trials, which, you know, led to the FDA approval of this particular product. And so the result, because of what we talked about today with the differences in products, um, you know, based on the plant's just features, we can't generalize any of the information that is known from those trials to any other of the unregulated products and vice versa. I mean, but at the regulated products. So, so to answer your question, we've, they've done all the studies to prove that, you know, this is a safe and verified consistent product and it's not the same as the, the, the items you can get, um, you know, over the counter because it is available by prescription only. Okay, so it's also not just for anybody that has seizures. There's just a small group that will that they'll help. So it's, it's so right now the data is available for those particular um, syndromes because that's the population that it was studied in. Um, but I would definitely encourage you to you know have a conversation with your medical provider about because I don't know. Uh, your daughter's particular situation, and I, I can't offer any official advice. But if you know if that's something that you think you'd want more information on, then they are a great resource, and I'm sure would be able to answer your questions about the particular product in this in this situation. Yeah, can I ask you another question about CBD? Mm -hmm. So, along with all her seizures and other issues, she doesn't ever sleep. Never, never, never sleeps, and has anxiety. And I'm so against adding anything else. So I went to some CBD stores and asked questions and I found one that I felt comfortable with. And I saw on one of your slides where there was a CBN, which is what I bought for her to sleep. Hmm. And there's a little, one of those, like, what are those codes that you can scan with your phone? Like to look the at QR a menu and it's got everything that's in it that they say. It is the only thing that has helped my daughter sleep since she's been an infant. A quarter of a dropper or an eighth of a dropper under her tongue and she sleeps. So I was so excited, but now I'm afraid that maybe I'm giving her something that's killing her liver. I don't even know. <laughs> well, you, know, you think you're doing something good and staying away from more pills. And now I don't know if what I'm doing, but that same store gave me these samples she was having a seizure and I gave it to her before her rescue and it stopped her seizure. Hmm. So I'm like, yay, 
okay. So I said to the nurse, can you give her this? She goes with a doctor's note. I can't. Well, my doctor, her pediatrician won't give me a note. Mm. So I'm like, I keep them in my pocket at all times. So now I'm like, well, this helped stop seizure. And yeah. it's not versed. Yeah. So now I'm like, do I not give her that? I have more questions now. I don't even, no. <laughs> I'm going to have to go on to your website and just start reading and reading. That's exactly what I was going to recommend. I think that you'll find the a lot more answers, especially to specific questions on cannabinoid clinical, because it gives you really in-depth information to everything that I spoke about today, but it also provides you resources. So if you want to learn more about a particular topic or you want to know about a particular cannabinoid or how they're working, that this website goes into all of it and our company creates it. And I think it's an excellent resource for that'll hopefully clarify some of those questions. But it's amazing to hear like the the different you know, anecdotal reports about what, um, you know, people, what happens when people use these products. But unfortunately, based on the, what we talked about today, there are just a lot of barriers to fully understand what in the, you know, what, what kind of plant did that come from? You know, which, like what chemical, you know, what variety was it? And like, do they have that information so that they can do a study to show that it's demonstrated efficacy in like a large population, you know, you know, and so, so it's always tough to, to understand the nuances behind all of these things. Um, but I encourage you to read more on cannabinoid clinical and just, you know, keep your doctor informed and, and hopefully one day we can understand fully the therapeutic potential of all these different compounds that are in the cannabis plant. Right. Yeah. So and thank you for sharing and asking questions. Yeah. And I know you have to go. So I'll just quickly, but I know the lack of sleep is one of the biggest issues we have with our children. Mm -hmm. like lack of sleep is killing my son. Right. Mm -hmm. And causing so many issues. And again, yeah. Do I give them, you know, an over the counter drugs adding to the other medications. So I'm interested in the CBN too, because. No, I, that was for sleep. The CBN was for sleep, sleep but that's, there's also, that's oh yeah. I, I need him to sleep. He needs to sleep and it's our biggest issue. And if you don't sleep, mm -hmm. how do you live? Your anxiety goes up, their seizure activity goes up. And how do you work? How do you live a normal life if you don't sleep? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Anyway, thank Jessica, thank you so much. This was such a fantastic presentation. And I think like if anything, a big takeaway, and I'm so excited to be able to add this to our library of webinars is to just, as you're saying, you know, just do some of that research on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and even just, I was, I was thinking, even just looking luck, doing more research on the particular company that the product is coming from and, and just starting from there. Now that, now that she's given you the basis, um, now you can kind of, um, you know, look at the specific products that you're wanting, you know, if that's what you're deciding to do for your, for your child. But yeah, I, I know there's so many issues involved, right. In, in these kids or in, in, for individuals that have epilepsy, it's not just the seizures, right. It's, there's right. so many other aspects and sometimes, um, you know, a product like this, that is, you know, there, there's some hope there, but but this was just so wonderful. And I'll just reiterate really quickly, you know, what you said, Jessica, was that anything that's not FDA approved cannot be considered um, medicinal with therapeutic benefits. And I thought that, that was a really great statement. And, and even just to share with people that have, because we have so many um, clients that um, do go to dispensaries and, and are taking medical marijuana. Um, and they have those questions like, you know, that we, we don't take specific position on ourselves, but I think that that's just something to just remember. And there's reasons for that. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Definitely. And that doesn't mean it won't have a, like beneficial effects, but it just hasn't been, you know, extensively studied in that same process that we've studied the other medications that we typically consider medicine. Right. Yeah. But thank you so much for everyone logging on. I really appreciate the opportunity and Monica, thank you again. I will uh, be happy to follow up with any other webinars in the future. And if you guys have any questions, hopefully you find the cannabinoid clinical resource helpful. Right. And if people have additional questions that we don't have time to answer now, Jessica, do you, do you mind if I um, reach out to you with those questions? 
Sure, I'm more than happy to answer and help field any questions. Great. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your night. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Bye, bye. Thank you.